Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next edition of our Trade Centric University Masterclass Series, A Winning Digital Strategy, How Miller Knoll Leverages Salesforce and Trade Centric to Drive Success. Today, our hosts are Kevin Kazemeyer, Head of Channel Development at Trade Centric, Andy Peebler, VP Business Strategy and Growth, Commerce Cloud at Salesforce, Shay Anglin, Senior Manager, B2B e-commerce at Miller Knoll, and Shannon Zonka, Senior Director, Contract e-commerce and Dealer Technology, also at Miller Knoll. In this session, you will get perspective from two Miller Knoll senior level e-commerce experts who will share their real world success story, valuable insights on the importance of partnering with the right providers, proven strategies for maximizing the value of your e-commerce investment through seamless integration. As a reminder, you will be on mute for the duration of this masterclass webinar. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A function and we'll address them at the end. And now I'd like to turn it over to our co-host, Kevin. Thank you, Melissa. Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining our session today. Uh, I'm the head of channel development at Trade Centric, and for those of you who don't know us, we've been the middleware or integration platform that sits on top of a supplier's commerce platform, allowing them to support punch out and connected commerce really to to all of their buyers transacting on e-procurement systems for probably the last 12 plus years. Um, I'm excited to be facilitating this conversation today between these two amazing companies, Salesforce and, and Miller and Ohl. So. Let's take a few minutes to uh, meet our guest. So first off, uh, Andy, welcome and uh, thanks for joining. If you could uh, give us a little introduction, tell us about yourself. Hey, Cameron, thank you so much for having us. And, and it's my pleasure to, to uh, be here for this conversation today. I'm Andy Peebler. I run the strategy for Commerce Cloud here at Salesforce. I've worked in the e-commerce and digital space for longer than I care to admit, uh, over 20 years. And uh, it, it's my pleasure to be here talking about the field of digital and commerce and where we see the future going with uh, such a distinguished panel. Great, thanks. All right, uh, how about uh, Shannon, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and Miller Knoll? Sure, happy to. And thanks again for including us in this session today. Um, I'm Shannon Zonka, I'm the Senior Director of Contract E-Commerce and Dealer Technology. So my team works on our B2B e-commerce capability as well as all of our technology to support our dealer network. Um, been in this digital e-commerce space for most of my career with many years here at Miller Knoll in a variety of roles. I'm really excited for this topic today and I'll turn it back to you to introduce Shay. All right. And last but not least, uh, Shay, welcome and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, Kevin. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm Shayna or Shay Anglin, and I lead our B2B e-commerce team and program at Miller Knoll. We focus on, support, focus on uh, B2B e-commerce, customer onboarding, account management, account development, all the things that are involved with running a successful B2B e-commerce business and program. Um, I've been with Miller Knoll almost 18 years. Um, like Shannon, I've been with the e-commerce space most of my time here at Miller Knoll. And um, I'm looking forward to our discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so a lot of excitement, a lot of energy, and I say we just uh, jump in. So let's uh, let's start off with some some roundtable here, and and Shannon, we'll start with you. Uh, and to kick us off, how about uh, could you share some insight into your goals around B two B e commerce? Sure, absolutely. Um, really, our goal is to grow our revenue um, through offering a modernized, seamless, and customer centric e commerce experience. We really strive to make it easier for our customers and easier for our dealers. And if we can do that really well, it helps us deepen our relationship with existing customers, as well as drive new business opportunity and reach more customers. Uh, we've got an exciting roadmap we're working on as a team. I'm very thankful to have one of my team members here. We've got a great team at, at Miller Knoll and some of our vendor partners um, supporting those goals for how we can help grow our B2B e-commerce business. Awesome. Sounds great. Sounds like you have a really, really good plan there. A nice, solid strategic plan. 
Um, and I know that e-procurement is part of that, that strategic plan as well. So Shay, could you talk to us a little bit about your approach in leveraging e-procurement as a strategic channel? Yeah, so we know that this channel is very important because we've seen that large B2B customers are focused on automation and integration. And, you know, I've seen firsthand many of our clients um, have, you know, transition, you know, they're either um, have already implemented e-procurement platforms and they're, you know, reaching out to connect um, and work with suppliers that are enabled um, for punch out, most likely punch out or most commonly punch out. Um, and, you know, basically we see it as it's, a, it's, it's no longer a nice to have, it's more of a must have. And so we've really focused in on e-procurement as a key strategy for business growth for Miller Knoll. And that is what's really has prompted us to, you know, continue to invest in our capabilities. And so we offer things like punch out, electronic purchase orders, invoicing, quoting. We make it a priority to really understand and continue to understand our customers, what they're looking for, what they expect in the e-commerce space. And our goal is to deliver that. So it sounds like when you started, this was more, you, you had to do this because of customer demand or customer driven. So is that how you got there? Was it was it customer led or did you decide like in concert that it was something that it was a demand, but we needed to do it to grow? So in the from what I recall, um, early, earlier in my career, Miller Knoll or legacy Herman Miller prior to our acquisition with Knoll, um, we were really a pioneer in the e-commerce space in you know furniture manufacturing, and it was definitely a scenario where we, you know, it was a benefit. You know, it was something, it was a differentiator for us. And what I've seen over the years is is a change. And, you know, we were leading with it. And now we've seen that our customers are pretty much telling us, I hear on a regular basis, if we want to do business with a particular organization, whether it's higher education, global account, um, federal government, state and local government, healthcare. I'm hearing more and more that if we want to do business with business with them, that we absolutely have to have these capabilities and we have to be a preferred supplier in order to transact with their with these clients and their end users. Okay, so it's become pretty much table stakes then to to mm -hmm. any conversation. That's true. Okay. So thinking about that, Shannon, Right. You you've been uh, you've been offering commerce for, you know, many years, as, as, as Shay mentioned, a, a pioneer. And now you recently replatformed to Salesforce. So I wonder if you could kind of talk us through your decision to do that and, and you know, where you came from to where you're going to. Sure. Happy to. Um, you know, we as we look at the growth of e-commerce and how much, as, as Shay mentioned, we've got a lot of clients that are really looking for this capability as a table stakes and something they require in order to do business with them. We needed a platform that could really scale with us as we're looking to scale that business. And the way our buyers shop is actually kind of unique from some other commodities. We sell through an authorized dealer network. So our clients actually transact from their authorized dealer, and that dealer will purchase the furniture from Miller Knoll. And we have highly configurable product catalog. And it also means with furniture, oftentimes these clients need additional services. It's not purely just the item. They may need service. They may need installation. There's other things that come along with it. So when we started to look at what we needed in order to support this business, we really recognized that we couldn't just pick an out-of-the-box platform off the shelf and have it work for every single thing that we needed to do. 
because we need the ability to facilitate quoting. We need the ability to pass unique data fields uh, and formats that help support some of the floor plate design and space planning design that our dealers do on behalf of our clients. So we worked really closely with Salesforce as well as Trade Centric to really pull down to what are those core customer requirements? What would we get with each of the different platforms and how we needed to best solution for supporting that unique flow of information and orders that happen between our client and our dealers in Miller Null. Um, so that's really where we landed with, with Salesforce. So both Salesforce and Trade Centric have been excellent partners in this initiative, and we're really excited about where we're at. We just recently replatformed um, and are in progress of migrating customers over to our new Salesforce experience. Um, so we've got a long road to go, uh, but really, really excited for where we're at at this point. That's excellent. And and it sounds exciting in, in the fact that you've kind of taken this journey and continue to build on and enhance it. So I wonder if you could tell me just a little bit more of like, what what is it specifically that, that Salesforce does to support your business model and, and, and your integration within this, this whole network ecosystem that you have? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, the way I'd answer that is I think it's a few things, um, but predominantly Salesforce at its core has a really strong foundation of, of that data and our CRM tool, being able to understand those relationships between our clients and our dealers. And we're able to build our e-commerce experience tied into that. We have a unique setup, right? Where you've got a, a specific customer catalog by customer and you might have a dealer that's serving more than one customer. So Salesforce worked with us and made it really easy to help set up that right structure so the right people have access to the right things and it's all connected back into the data uh, on our end on the back end. Okay. That's 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 great. And and so Andy, let me turn to you now. So hearing what we just heard from both uh Shay and Shannon around, you know, their requirements and and how they're set up and and the need for Salesforce, um I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what what are you seeing on the Salesforce side and, and Salesforce users? And and are they investing in e-procurement as a strategic channel as well? Oh, absolutely. And, and first off, thank you, Shannon, for your kind words. I appreciate um, all of that. Uh, and certainly, uh, we love supporting Miller Knoll and they use such great products and such great markets and such great opportunities. So thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to work with you. But um, what I would say on the topic of e-procurement in general is this. Everyone's right. Like um, we, we've seen a long transition uh, past the days where um, kind of e-procurement, especially in, in certain commodity categories, was an option or a nice to have. It's sort of a mandatory, as everyone said, table stakes. And 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 from a trend line perspective, as providers of commerce apps for both B two C and B two B, we see the trend not going anywhere. Like it's going to continue. It'll e-procurement requirements are going to continue to show up in more and more commodity categories over time. It's it's possible to not have that be the case, right? We just have to anticipate every company, every business is looking to automate different functions, which I think was well said uh, earlier by Shay. So we continue to see it going. Now, to me, that that's all the more reason why the sort of core engineering relationship that we have as Salesforce commerce platform providers with folks like trade centric are so important. Like it, 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 you know, take another office, like, like say office products, for example, at, like just pens, paper supplies. That's a category that's been in e-procurement forever. And it's really a dominant purchasing category for there. Well, even e even people who sell those products in e-commerce must have a way to handle e-procurement and their regular direct channels and their dealer channels all the same way. So what that means, the responsibility for companies like Salesforce and Trade Centric is we have to make it really, really simple. This cannot be um, managing thousands of different uh, repositories of product information by dealer, by customer segment, et cetera. It's really important that us as Trade Centric and Salesforce come together to provide folks like Miller Knoll a solution where they can do it all in one place around the customer. And, you know, if we're selling to a large corporate hospitality client, it's really important that all of the dealers for Miller Knoll that service that client in different places see the same products, same prices that are negotiated as if that, that, that customer went onto their website. That can only happen if we nail the plumbing and the engineering of the platforms, right? That's why 
you know, there just can't be a lot of daylight between commerce platforms and 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 something like trade centric for punch out. Um, otherwise, you know, it's really not possible to scale. Now, what's really exciting, I think, and, and this is where, you know, Shay and Shannon have had such leadership for a, a long time in this area that the companies that get this mix right is that you can start to have a lot of fun from a growth perspective. Meaning, you know, if you nail the plumbing right, if if we can launch, you know, B2B specific buying experiences that reflect the dealers that they buy, if we can respect the procurement systems, that's what, that means we can launch more customer specific experiences and get more products into all of those channels to accelerate buying. Like if the, if the system is engineered properly, you got a lot of opportunity for growth that doesn't include like firefighting and turning things on. It gets you that sort of scale to go further. And so we're really proud uh, to see the great success that Miller Knoll has had. Um, and I, I, I thank you know, the team at Trade Centric actually for help because I think this engineering has to be simple. I, I completely agree. And, and the thing about it is like, I'm hearing everybody with this ringing endorsement a procurement we have the need we have the 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 business users telling us that that we need to show up salesforce building the modules to support the multi channels but what i hear a lot still out in the market and you know in the last year at different conferences is that's not my customer base i don't have those customers i'm not dealing with that type of customer or you know what that's that's not a channel for me what do you say to to someone who kind of reacts that way? And and I guess I'll I'll leave it open to anybody that wants to to jump in there. But Andy, you know, I'll throw it first to you. You know, what do you say to that? Well, I you know I, I do think that there are variances into in different sectors and different products. That's for sure true. So there are nuances on this topic, like anything, depending on industry and category and sometimes even geography. But almost every business. I suspect at this point has had one request or another from big prospects that they must play in e-procurement systems. It is almost impossible that that population of request doors won't grow over time, much like the growth of e-commerce itself, to be honest with you. So I think each business and commodity will probably follow a slightly different path and maturation, but you know, I, I think the discussion point for companies that are feeling like maybe it's not going to come are really largely on watch that space, right? I mean, I like I highly doubt, Shay and Shannon, maybe this was even before your time, but the first time some customer asked Miller Knoll to do this, I doubt the response was, oh, yeah, I'm going to jump right on it. Like companies will sort through it depending on how to prioritize resources in the best interests of their customer. And and like leaning into what your customers actually need and understanding sometimes you might cross a line where they might say, hey, man, I love your furniture. I love your products. I want to buy this, but I can't. And 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 it's really important for, to be mindful of those lines. I would like yeah, to add. Oh, sorry, Shannon, go ahead. No, nope, you go ahead, Shay. <laughs> Um, I was just going to say, I, I encourage organizations to talk to their customers. Don't wait for a client to come to you and ask for these capabilities. Nine times out of 10, we're missing the boat on opportunities because we're not talking about it. Um, many examples, you know, in the past um, for us personally, where, you know, we've gone to talk to a client and you know, our sales partner, we, we weren't sure what type of, you know, procurement, you know, what part of their journey they were in. And we actually learned um, that they were quite far in their journey and they had hundreds of suppliers already on board. And we just hadn't been invited because they didn't know that we had the capability. And so I urge, you know, companies to have those conversations with your customers. The other thing that I would mention is important to understand is that there are different flavors of e-commerce, right? So as Andy mentioned, sometimes, you know, our clients are purchasing through what we call, you know, marketplaces, which is another, you know, another variety, right? Different capabilities. Um, some of our clients, um, you know, some customers by, might be ut utilizing hosted catalogs versus punch out. And then there are some customers that are using both 
punch out and hosted catalogs. But the main thing is just have a conversation with your customer. Well said. Yeah. Shannon, did you want to add to that? You know, I think I think Shay said it really well. I'd say the only other flavor I would I would tell this audience to keep in mind is with the pace of e-commerce growth, customer expectations have changed. And there's more and more of our customers that are expecting a consumer or retail-like shopping experience for their business. And I think that's a really important trend to keep in mind. And it's something we've kept at the forefront of the work our teams have been doing. How do you make it as easy and streamlined as possible? And some of our customers, to Shay's point, are at different points in the journey. And, and Andy mentioned this as well. But at the end of the day, every single one of our business buyers is a consumer at heart. And they're doing online shopping, online purchasing in their personal lives. And so that we do see that come into what their expectations are and how they want to transact as a business. Definitely. And, you know, thinking about that, right? So you have the demand for specific capabilities. They want an experience that meets the needs of their users. They want it streamlined. And, you know, Andy, I'm thinking about, you know, recently at a Salesforce manufacturing summit that we attended earlier this month, this, there's just been this whole concept in the Salesforce world about offering your customers a single pane of glass experience. And it sounds like a lot of what we're talking about kind of fits into that vision. So I wonder if you could share a little bit of light on what that concept is and why it's so important to Salesforce. Sure, I will. And I also, I, I, Shannon said something that I wanted to comment on too. And, and let me maybe start there. I, I think, again, Shannon and Shay are, are, are great recommendations for um, everyone listening. And, and one thing that I, I, I think I'd be remiss to not point out here is that um, look at the source, meaning I, I would be hard pressed to name a furniture company, certainly an office and residential that has better brands than Miller and all like, oh my goodness, the um, history of the brands from Herman Miller to Knoll to, uh, you know, the newer assortment of designers that have been added, like the halo on the brands, people love the products. In fact, you know, in some categories, you probably have the default uh, picture in Wikipedia or something for certain categories. So like everybody loves Miller and all stuff, but the world is the world. And there are pools of buyers that simply wouldn't be allowed to purchase the stuff they want to buy and otherwise would buy if Miller Knoll didn't have this capability. It doesn't mean that all the other channels go away. As the team said, like marketplaces and consumer and other people will find a way to get this stuff in other ways. People will still buy through your existing channels. But Shutting this down can have a profound impact, even for those companies that may feel like, oh, but my brand is powerful and I'm the best one and I'm, you know, whatever. The world is changing. And so I think that's mindful that brand power alone doesn't pull you through this. Um, and and Millenol is a really great example of that. Now, the other question uh, on Salesforce, uh, bringing everything together around the customer. One of the best examples of that is, is in fact, this topic. And, and when we say that, what we mean is that, that Salesforce is really a logical place to be that system of engagement uh, for your end customers. So single pane of glass is referenced to having everything around that customer that you're serving, that B2B buyer, what, what kind of products are they allowed to buy? What kind of pricing can they uh, 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 receive? How do they receive goods? How do they pay? All of that. And making all of that information available in a single pane for however that customer needs to purchase. So sharing things like configuration wizards for self-service and for a dealer to use. So we can help educate everybody at the same time on how to configure, buy and use these products. Being able to have all of that together, both for self-service users and that dealer person that's helping to close that next sale of office furniture. It's the same tool, same capability, same data, all of that's together right where you need it. Um, and it sounds hard, but that's really the reality of how modern businesses like this have to work. We have to be helping our dealers, helping, um, you know, meet the needs of modern commerce with things like e-procurement and do other things. It's got to, you got to just got to be everywhere at once. And having that single pane, single system that we can um, uh, use as a common point is really useful. 
it's a it's a great concept and it's it's i think really relevant in this case here right when you think about how miller knoll operates on this dealer network right and earlier on um shannon talked about the dealer network and the uniqueness and have to stand up individual sites sometimes and so jay i wonder if you could kind of talk a little bit more about you know, in that concept of what Andy's saying about the single pane of glass, how does that impact your dealer network and how does that dealer network impact your strategy going forward? Well, um, I would answer that by saying that, you know, we sell primarily through our dealer network, um, which means they are a very important part of our strategy. Uh, they have the relationships on the ground in the local markets with our customers and, you know, they're really, you know, they own those relationships. And so for us, you know, our focus is on, you know, what can we do to support them? How can we help them drive more business for their business and for ours? And so our goal is to help make it easier for them to, you know, do business with our, custom with our customers and for their customers to do business with them. And so our program, our e-commerce program, that's what we strive for. We're building these e-commerce, these customer-specific e-commerce sites for our dealer and our customer. We see our dealer as a customer, just as our actual end customer, because we realize that in order to be successful, um, it has to be a tool that our dealers can really promote and use and really adopt to. So, oh, I was so, going to also okay. add that we also see, and our dealers are sharing with us very openly. Um, in fact, Shannon was at a conference last week, uh, one of our dealer conferences, and she shared that a number of our dealer leaders had, you know, walked up to her and was just kind of you know, discussing the program and how important it is and, and how much value they see in it. And it was very reassuring. We're hearing directly from our dealers as well that they're seeing and hearing increasing demand from their customers as well. That's great. And so I, I, I was thinking about, you know, other businesses I've worked with that run in similar pattern, a similar type dealer supported network that sometimes struggle with this. And and so Shannon, what else have you done like from a corporate strategy perspective that gets that dealer to buy in, right? If they're they're giving you all these accolades at these shows, what is it that you've done that that makes them say, I'm in, I'm all in and I'm going to do whatever I can to support this? That's a great question. I think it's a few things. First and foremost, we we have really strong relationships with our dealers and they are amazing. They are excellent at what they do. And we listen. We've taken their feedback over the years. We've worked really closely with our dealer network to understand what's working, what what drives the most value for them. And honestly, the way we can drive the most value is making it easier for them to do business with our customers. If we make it easier for them, they can spend more time driving more business versus doing manual hands-on work. And that's the beauty of e-procurement and e-commerce is it, it brings all that digital and makes the flow much more automated. So it's a big part of getting the dealer buy-in is just showing them the value. And as soon as they see that value, they just can't get enough. Um, so it's it's been a really great partnership over the years, but it's it's listening to your customer, listening to your dealer, addressing those needs and showing that value and that impact for them. Great. And so you know, that alignment has allowed you to 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 move faster than with that buy. -in. Correct. Yes. So well, if I could go ahead. Uh, Jamie. Sorry, what I just was going to add. I mean, this is signs of a really well orchestrated program. I think that, you know, the team at, at Miller Knoll has uh, put a good bit of time in developing mm -hmm. governance, meaning the way in which you prioritize capabilities that grow across the e-commerce platform. And you know, what we see in most organizations is when you start a transformation journey like this, and I, Shannon and Shay, when you guys started some of these things at Miller and all, those dealer conferences maybe didn't go that way. They 
might have been a little bit more like, oh, why can't I do this or what's this and blah, blah, blah. And and I, I think what's really great to see, and I, I've seen this in so many different organizations that we've helped over the years, is that no matter how rough that first conversation is or from the place you are coming from, which could be a point of, hey, why aren't you doing this for me lately? The key really is setting up a program from the outset where we have a good set of stakeholders engaged, A, and so that people do feel like they're not just being heard, but they can see signs that the prioritization is making an impact. And then delivering consistent incremental change on that roadmap over time. None of these things materialize overnight immediately, but typically once you can demonstrate period over period, things getting better and improving, you can actually see those relationships turn. You can see the collaboration really uptick. And even before some of the capabilities they really need actually land, you end up with a much more engaged dealer community, et cetera. But nailing that governance uh, and like everything, none of, and none of those words were just technical platform, whatever. It's the governance. It's this, this, and then the getting the cadence where you're sort of consistently delivering really turns the tide. So great job to the folks at Miller Gold. For sure. And so, you know, I'm, I want to just build on that, right? And thinking of, you talk about the, the consistent change and getting that dealer network buy-in. So Shannon, earlier you, you mentioned about the reason why you chose Salesforce was the ability to, to support that dealer network, right? And the ability to, to stand up individual instances. So, you know, um, if you think about it in that in that context, and as as Andy mentioned, right, you're you got them bought in initially, and now you're just going to make it better and better and better. What is it that Salesforce did for you that is allowing you to support getting better and better for the dealers, and and how will they support that within your dealer network? Yeah, it's a it's a really great question, and I, and to be honest, it's something that we've had a lot of discussion about on our journey. Right, we have we have clients and we have dealers that will ask us. Can you do X, Y, Z thing? And that might be unique for this client versus this client. So when we really started to think about this, we knew we had to stand it up in a way that we could scale and that we could provide value in a more effective manner across our dealers and across our customers. So what we worked with Salesforce on is we have a huge product catalog. As, as Miller Knoll, we're a collective of leading design brands. We have hundreds of thousands of products, millions and millions of SKUs, because all of our products are highly configurable. So we had to really think about what's the best way to manage that information coming in to the experience so that we could have a curated product catalog for each customer that isn't overwhelming, but aligns to their standards. Oftentimes these clients are ordering particular products because that's the design of their office and they have certain chairs and certain desks that go in particular places. So we worked with Salesforce, we have a, a PIM system, and we really worked to set up the architecture that would allow us to tailor the product assortment, but ensure we're taking a platform-based approach to how we think about the capability and the feature set and how we roll out enhancements. Because as, as Andy mentioned really, really effectively, this isn't a launch it and walk away and we're done. This is an ongoing thing. We launched our first iteration and we're and we use agile methodology. We're releasing every two weeks and sprint cycles. So we're going to continue to add on and enhance and add more features, but we're doing it in a way that can scale it to all of our customers and all of our dealers that are on the experience so that everybody benefits when we when we bring in feature enhancements. So I'd say that that's really the piece where we shifted from a let's stand up an individual site for a particular customer to how do we create a site that has tailored content and information by audience that allows us to kind of roll things in a bit more of a, a scalable and repeatable way. So being able to tailor a lot of these sites and stand up individual unique sites for not only your customers, but your dealer network, I'm assuming that there's had to be some some serious ROI in that as well. So whether whatever you've done leading up to it, and now if you as you launch Salesforce and and seeing the the benefits and rewards from there. So uh, can you talk a little bit about the Absolutely. ROI that you've seen with this? 
Yeah, and I'd say it's still early days. Um, we just recently launched on Salesforce, uh, but we're seeing some really nice incremental lift for the first experience, first customers and dealers that we're serving on the platform. Um, so again, early days, but we're really excited about where we're headed and where we're at in our, our journey. Um, and certainly we'll, we'll share more as we have more to share in the future. Okay, so obviously if you're seeing ROI, um, you know, that's something that the, the organization from the top down really wants to see. So how is leadership buying into this, this change and, and, and the way that you're approaching things? Cause I've, I've seen some companies struggle with getting full buy-in from the C-suite. So how, how are you handling that? And how is it at Millernal? That's, that's another great question. So We've had this amazing capability for many, many years um, and how we've serviced this customer base and with our e-commerce and e-procurement capabilities. And what we're able to do is take what we had and put together a business case to say, here's where we want to go. This is what we believe the future is. And this is what we believe that, that growth opportunity is. And we brought that to our leadership team. And I'm incredibly thankful. We've got an amazing leadership team. We have a number of them that are, are, are what I would think of as digitally native. So they really understand the value of e-commerce. They understand the value of serving our customers digitally. And so it was an easy sell. You know, anytime you have investment, you always have, you know, you've got some conversations to have around that. Um, but I'd say the team did a really great job of putting together a clear and concise business case, where we're at, where we want to go, what it would take to get there. And that's how we're able to get the leadership buy-in and, and investment to move forward. Uh, it's been a really exciting journey, and it's it's been great to see the type of organizational support we've had for this initiative. And that's great to hear because that that top down support um, can really drive the success of a program, right? So you're not battling constantly battling uphill, and and you know thinking about that and and the support that they have in their organization, Andy. Um, you know what Salesforce roadmap to kind of help continue to drive more. B2B commerce for Miller Nolan to support their goals? Great question. And thank you for asking. Well, I, and I think that the, the kind of biggest thing for us here is that none of these tactics and strategies in isolation are like the only thing to do, right? I mean, uh, one of the great hallmarks of a, a thriving, high growth kind of uh, organization like Miller Knoll is that. Miller Knoll is not only selling through e-procurement channels and B2B commerce websites. It, Miller Knoll is rather active uh, commercially everywhere, selling to consumers, um, selling through, still through people, their dealer people that go to offices and help position it. So e-procurement and even B2B self-service is not a either or <clears throat> sort of thing. In fact, to capture the full scale of growth, um, it's an and channel, like you know, companies still expect to want to talk to somebody if they've got a really important question. So making sure we can serve the, even those self-service customers when they call you is really important. And so, you know, I think having a perspective that these digital innovations, including a procurement is a, is, is sort of a table stake is an, and channel. It's not an, or channel. It doesn't mean the other things are going away. It just means that we have to do these things in addition and scale our business appropriately with that as kind of the new reality. And as you know, Shannon and Shay have been uh, really good at demonstrating is that I think when you have the kind of alignment with your exec team, that that's the way the business is going to grow and you're able to demonstrate some early returns and momentum, these things tend to like go pretty well over time, right? I mean, I, I think we're betting on some pretty large mega trends here, which is companies will want to automate and continue to ring lots of costs. Yes. Everyone in the world prefers quick self-service experiences over long call times if you have a choice. But we still want to be able to talk to people when we got a question. So I think, you know, thinking about that, all of these things in concert, and it's not either or, it's and, how do we prioritize and invest? I mean, this is the kind of path that tends to be, you know, self-fulfilling. And sometimes I joke, and, and this is a total joke, but like, hey, people like the internet. Turns out there's still a lot of growth, a lot of growth in segments from both a channel shift and overall adoption. And, it, you know, it may sound a little bit flowery to say this, but I actually think that the innings for like where we're really going to be for like B2B business transformation are still early days. Like there's still everybody, even for companies like Miller and all that have this great foundation, there's more customer 
websites to do. There's broader catalog to unlock. There's a lot of growth opportunity once you get these systems in place. And I think the more companies start to see that, it's, um, it becomes pretty self-rewarding. Yeah, and so people do like the internet, right? <laughs> and they like to shop the way they want to shop. And so thinking about the trade-centric alignment with Salesforce, how does trade-centric help Salesforce extend your B2B reach? You know, I, to be honest with you, the name of the game in our world is, I, I think the feature um, capabilities, the ability to kind of seamlessly align with the catalog data and launch these punch out experiences in, in concert with procurement is great. The engineering help and the continued work we have to make that even easier, more plug and play, less work, less specificity. That's where I think we're like, I know, cause I've seen our mutual plans together. We're gonna continue to work together to make it even easier. Like we're never done. Like until these things are literally plug and play and uh, shaken, like just think about a segment she wants to launch and it happens, we're not done. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to continue to make this less code. Honestly, that's the most important thing for the, our platform companies. We have to continue to take that down. Completely agree. And anything that we could do to make or extend that reach and make it easier for someone to not only buy in the e-commerce channel, but the e-procurement channel through the same platform just makes it better for everyone. Indeed. All right. Well, we're getting close to time here. So I want to wrap it up by first off thanking everyone for their, you know, participation and, and uh, engagement. I, I really appreciate it. But I'm going to turn it over to Melissa and open it up for some questions because I see questions coming in the chat. I know uh, you're going to take it from here. So, Melissa. Yes. Um, the first is for Shay and Shannon. The question is, what would you say are the most important requirements to be successful in investing in e-procurement? Good question. So I'll, I'll start and Shay, feel free to add on if I miss anything. Um, I'd say the first one we've talked about a little bit, which is really that leadership alignment. And, and you gain that through creating a clear and concise business case. And so that's that's the first ingredient. Um, See, so the other ingredient really is having the team expertise and talent. I know I'm biased, but we have an incredibly talented team <laughs> at Miller Knoll, and, and that makes all the difference. When you have people who really know the space, who can work closely with our clients, with our dealers, help them understand the value, help work through the onboarding, that's that's a big part of success. Um, and then I'd say the other, the other ingredient to really being successful and in investing in e-procurement is customers who understand and appreciate the value of this capability. For those that really get it, this is a big deal and it's a game changer for them. And as we talked about on this call, it's a baseline requirement to do business. Um, but if you have customers that don't understand that value, it's gonna be a bit of a tougher sell and a little bit harder to get that traction. Shay, anything you would add that I missed? Um, well, you did a great job. Those are all the things that I, I would definitely say. Um, if I were to add a few, I would say the other, I think, key key thing would be strategic partnerships. So um, in order for us to be successful, you know, we we have we know furniture, we know our e-commerce capabilities, but we're not integration experts. And so um, partnering with Trade Centric has definitely helped us tremendously in, you know, us being able to migrate or, you know, implement and integrate faster with our clients and, and really scale there. Um, leveraging, you know, expertise from Salesforce has also been, you know, help to us and contributing to our success. But also, you know, our sales organization and our dealer organization, we talked a lot about our Miller and Old dealers, but our, our sales organization is very important. And it is super important to our success, to our success as a company in this um, field that we partner with them and that there's alignment there and that we're doing our port our part to support them and make sure that they're armed with the information that they need about our program and our services to, you know, to have those conversations with customers and to help support our dealers. So I think that those are important also. Great, Alex. Thank you. Great. Thank you both. 
Um, Andy, a question came in for you and it's how can Salesforce AI be used to create a B2B commerce site customized with the right items and pricing for specific customers? Great question. Um, and, and we are quite bullish on the impact of AI, especially for commerce merchants and kind of two areas that we're investing in um, and that we've seen some good early results uh, from our customers in the commerce space. One is um, just set up help for um, folks like Shannon and Shay's teams automating certain tasks from launching a new site to routing product information in a certain way, um, using AI to help merchants even complete product descriptions where um, information may be lacking. Those are new capabilities that, that we've just added to the commerce platform to just help merchants streamline the work, automate the work, um, and there's even, there's a lot more you can do. Imagine even automating product catalog flows through punch out and different catalogs into the first party site experiences. So there's great opportunity for merchant automation, fewer clicks, fewer steps to launch new experiences. But the other thing that's also really fun, and, and I think at, at one area where we're literally just barely getting started in the B2B space, especially are more bot driven, um, artificial intelligence purchase configure kind of decisions. So we can now, given the breadth of the catalog for those kind of companies that have the full catalog in place, really provide digital experiences akin to what, um, you know, uh, other kind of product experts might do, even visual configuration experiences. Can I look at a chair like this? So that, that, and we're just barely, I think, lighting up some of those digital engagement opportunities. But again, our philosophy for every interaction has got to be, that's got to be as easy to set up as the e-procurement channel or the self-service channel and kind of just come in complete. Like there's no way that businesses like Hill, Miller and all can afford to say, oh, I'm going to go do this AI thing and put a pause on my e-procurement strategy. We got to do it all. Um, and so I think whether it's merchant productivity to set up and deliver these experiences and run them, or customer side experiences, it, it's make it faster and, and make it more transparent and easier to use these new channels and opportunities with the same data. Great, thank you, Andy. The next question that came in, it's a two-tier question. Um, it kicks off with a question for Shannon and Shay, um, and then it ends with a question for Kevin. Um, so Shannon and Shay, can you talk about the positives as well as the challenges for your customers, dealers or direct, when you change to using Salesforce Commerce Cloud? And then Kevin, um, how was the change from TradeCentric's point of view? Do you, you want to take the first stab or you want me to tackle this one? <laughs> um, okay, so let's see, positives. Um, I like to lead with a positive. I think that I can speak for uh, my team in saying that we've we've received a lot of positive feedback um, from the dealerships and customers that we have, I guess, socialized our migration to this new implementation. Everyone is super excited about it. Um, for the clients that have had the opportunity to see our new um, Miller Knoll B2B e-commerce experience, they're very impressed with the modernized look of the new experience. They're impressed with some features. Um, so, you know, it's a new launch. So we we still have, you know, a way to go in terms of socializing with, you know, our broader um, dealerships and sales organization and customers. But feedback has been great so far. Um, challenges. And I, and I will say first that, you know, this is to be expected no matter what, whenever there's a change, right? Um, change can be a challenge in, in any aspect. And I think that um, a challenge is, you know, for us as a business team, as we look at, you know, how do we help ensure success for our dealers and customers migrating over from our current platform to the new plat Salesforce platform. You know, there's some user slight user experience differences there, 
and there might be um, some change management that you know there that will take place. And from our perspective, it's a good challenge to have. And my team is working really, you know, diligently to work ahead and really identify what we know are going to be, you know, change management topics for our dealers and our customers and get ahead of it. You know, how can we, um, you know, bring this to light, you know, in advance and what, what can we do to help support that, whether it's, you know, creating training materials or videos and adding, you know, additional training, in-person training sessions, anything that we can do to help support that, we're going to do it. Anything else to add, Shannon, before I jump in? I'd say the other one, and Andy touched on this a little bit, is the other challenge that we have as an organization is getting faster with how we set up our product information and data and content and everything that needs to go into feeding the experience. So that's something we're continuing to work on and, and strive toward is as we have an updated tool set, how do we continue to continuously optimize, get faster, um, find those efficiencies? So I'd say just Andy's point earlier about merchant setup and administration is, you know, that's something that I think all of us as e-commerce businesses wrestle with and how do we get more efficient and go further faster with those processes. So I would say to add to that, um, from the trade-centric point of view, um, I think I'll echo Shay's comment about change, right? Change is always a little, a little challenging, but when it's coordinated and everybody's working together, uh, you can make it much easier than it should be. And I think, you know, from a mill and old perspective, they advised us early on of their changes and and their and their migration. And so being able to sit down and walk the tech team through what was happening and the Salesforce connector that Trade Centric has for the different Salesforce experiences, I think really helped with the education and made that transition maybe go a little bit easier than what you would have happened if you would have started from scratch, right? But I would also say, and Andy, you could probably reinforce this, is that, you know, we work so close together as, as two companies that, you know, when someone says, I want to turn on a Salesforce Commerce Cloud connector and make it punch out enabled, we are pretty much uh, have it all down pat. And, and there's not many bumps in the road if we get everybody, you know, marching to the same beat and following exactly what we want to do from, from building that connector and setting it up. Well, it's important. And, and as we continue to do as Salesforce and Trade Centric from time to time, we'll update the connectivity on both sides to make sure we're current and taking advantage of all the new things like AI. So, I mean, we've got to continue to keep the heat on that. But I would just say, in, you know, sort of a final add on to what Shay and Shannon are saying is this. I One of the funnest parts about my job at Salesforce is because we have thousands of commerce customers is I, do, I review a lot of business cases that our customers use to justify any investment. And I tend to be around for the on the hook conversation from executives who did invest and are we seeing those results? And 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 what I'm here to report is that land share of the time, yes, the results are tremendous. But for a double click down, ease of doing business is by far the most powerful economic motion any company can invest in from like a promotion marketing campaign perspective. I'm not talking about on the service level, but I am saying that anytime with any segment, you can take something that requires 10 steps and make it one, you will find money there. Um, whether that's clicks or omni-channel experiences, time and time again, especially in B2B, this ease of doing business factor rewards, sometimes in unpredictable ways, but generally speaking, when ease of doing business is how you're sort of justifying spend, you can be confident that it'll pay off. Um, more than many other things, by the way, like this in B2B in particular, really important. Thanks, Andy. Um, I think we have time for one more question, and it's, um, is it possible to be successful in e-procurement without invoicing terms for clients? Sounds like a loaded question. <laughs> I have my thoughts, but I will defer to the uh, 
actual practitioners on the call first. Shay, do you want to speak to this one and how we've been thinking about invoicing as a capability set? Yeah, so, you know, it's part of the B2B business process, right, for um, our dealer uh, partners to, you know, um, provide invoices to clients. Many of our clients pay with purchase orders, so it is part of the business process. And we know that in working with many of our clients that use e-procurement, um, they are, you know, it is it is a requirement. It's part of their business requirements that we we provide electronic invoicing, whether it's through a um, customer e procurement supplier portal, or through our B two B e commerce capability as CXML invoice. Um, you know, it is an important capability. We think about you know, the best connection with our customers and to, you know, I guess, piggyback on what Shannon had said earlier, we want to make it hard. We want to make it easy for them to do business with us, hard for them to leave us as a customer, right? We want to deepen our customer relationships. And the best way to do that is to provide that round trip order experience digitally. And for us, that means from providing that electronic catalog to capturing that purchase order via CXML electronically and sending that invoice, you know, through via ele electronically as well. That is super important. And and to build on that, that would be a single invoice, right? So even though your your dealers participate in the sale. You're still invoicing them as Miller Null, not the individual dealer. Uh, it depends. Um, I would say most of the time we it would be a dealer sell situation. So the purchase orders are made out to our dealerships individually. We do have some accounts where we have what, what I like to call a blended model, so to speak. Um, where the the purchase order is made out to Miller Knoll, but the dealership is servicing the account, handling the order management piece. Uh, but those are usually for very specific, you know, accounts. Most of the time, it's going to be um, our dealership. All right. Thank you, Shay. Um, thank you, Kevin, Andy, Shay, and Shannon, and thank you everybody for joining. As a reminder, please be on the lookout for details regarding our next trade-centric university masterclass, which will take place on February 8th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thanks again for joining and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.